For most people, the Christmas period is a highly anticipated and joyous time of year, and yet crime often continues unhindered throughout the festive period. In a small percentage of such occurrences, the identity of those responsible have never been uncovered, meaning that for the families of those involved, Christmas will forever remain a season of sadness. On the evening of the 29th of December 1999, firefighters in the city of Venita, Oklahoma were called out to a fire at a local trailer park. Upon arriving, they discovered the residence of the Freeman family completely ablaze, with every indication that the occupants had failed to escape. As the raging inferno was finally brought under control, investigators would learn the first of many unsettling developments relating to the incident. Police officers guarding the wreckage in the aftermath were approached by the parents of Luria Bible, who stated that their 16-year-old daughter had also been inside the trailer at the time of the blaze. Bible was best friends with Ashley Freeman and had stayed over following Ashley's 16th birthday party which had taken place the previous evening. An initial inspection of the trailer's remains determined that the fire had been started deliberately, with the body of Ashley's mother Kathy located inside. The revelation that the dead woman had been murdered with a shotgun beforehand went on to prompt a further search, which would later uncover the body of her husband, Danny. He too had been dispatched in the same manner, but of the two missing teenagers, there remained absolutely no trace. The subsequent investigation determined that personal possessions belonging to the two missing girls had been left at the scene, including their bags and driving licenses. These discoveries led the police to conclude that the girls had either fled before the fire started, or had instead been removed against their will. But despite some initial optimism surrounding the mystery, over the coming weeks, no leads materialized which might have assisted in locating them. Frustration over the lack of progress with the case soon took a dark turn, with the Bible family accusing the police themselves of complicity in the matter. It was rumored that Danny Freeman had confided to his brother that if anything was to happen to him and his family, the police should be the main suspects. Ashley's brother Shane had previously been shot and killed by a local deputy when he had been caught stealing a truck, and although the officer involved was cleared of any wrongdoing, Danny was said to be on the verge of bringing a private lawsuit against the police department. In the years that followed, Two different men serving life sentences for unrelated murders of local women would independently admit to killing Luria and Ashley. Both stated that they had killed the parents before abducting the girls and moving them to another area, where they too were later killed. But searches of the locations they had offered and investigations into their movements on the night of the incident would rule out both killers as viable suspects. Another theory surrounding the death speculated that Danny Freeman himself had caused the attack, due to his involvement in the local drugs trade. Eighteen years after the incident, evidence tracing three local drug users to the crime scene resulted in the arrest of a local male named Ronnie Dean Busick. 
Physical evidence and witness testimony would lead to charges against Busick for the murders of Kathy and Danny Freeman, but was ultimately insufficient to link him to the two missing girls. The disappearance of Laria Bible and Ashley Freeman remains intriguing, due to its parallels with the infamous case of the missing Sodder children. With the passage of time, those accused by witnesses of involvement in the killing have either passed away or continued to maintain their innocence. And although the missing girls have since been declared legally dead, the absence of their bodies means that those associated with the case never received the closure they so badly needed. A similarly tragic case involving the mysterious disappearance of several young girls had taken place 25 years prior in eastern Texas. On the 23rd of December 1974, 17-year-old Rachel Trickwer had agreed to drive her younger friend Renee Wilson to the South Seminary shopping mall in Fort Worth, Texas. The 14-year-old Wilson had arranged for a store to hold a pair of jeans for her and had pleaded with her older friend to take her across town to collect them. In a somewhat tragic twist of fate, the pair were joined at the last minute by another girl named Julianne Mosley, the nine-year-old sister of Renee's boyfriend, Terry. The trio had been expected back home by 4pm that day, as the two older girls had agreed to attend a Christmas party together. But when they had still not returned two hours later, several family members made their way to the mall to search for them. They would find Rachel's 1972 Oldsmobile sitting in the mostly empty car park of the mall, locked and unattended, with a single wrapped Christmas present visible on the rear seats. Enquiries by the local police at the Army and Navy store, where Wilson had reserved the jeans, confirmed that the three girls had collected the item. Friends of the girls would later confirm they subsequently saw the group wandering around various shops, apparently in search of some last-minute gifts. But no witnesses or CCTV footage could be found to explain how or why the girls had exited the mall and left the vehicle sitting in the parking lot in the process. The following morning, as he sat at home racked with worry, Rachel's husband Thomas received a strange letter in the post. The note appeared to have been hastily written and purported to be from his missing wife, informing him that she and the girls had travelled to Houston for the festive period. When he subsequently handed this letter over to the police, Trickwer expressed doubts over its authenticity to the officers. He cited the childlike nature of the handwriting and the fact that the author had addressed him as Thomas rather than Tommy, which is how Rachel referred to him. Due to a lack of evidence that the girls had been taken against their will, the police elected to treat the matter as a missing persons case, using the note to justify this decision. This immediately angered the three families involved, as it would result in far less police resources and media attention than an abduction or murder case. Neither the note nor the recovered vehicle was analysed for fingerprints or DNA, and a year later, the case had failed to move any further forward. Frustrated by the lack of progress, the families then started their own witness appeal, distributing flyers at the mall in an effort to jog the memories of shoppers and workers who were present at the time. Two witnesses believed they may have seen three girls being hustled into a yellow pickup or van in the car park by a man who had been overheard to mention family business. Another claimed he had observed a vehicle carrying three girls and two men entering the grounds of a local science laboratory on the night of the disappearance. But in all these cases, those involved could not be sure of what they had seen and would not provide written statements to support their testimony. With what little money they were able to save, the families later hired an investigator named John Swaim, in an effort to unearth further lines of inquiry. Swaim immediately got to work, 
setting up a tips hotline, and then organising searches of the areas where people reported the bodies of the girls might be found. These inquiries would ultimately come to nothing, but in a bizarre twist, when Swaim later committed suicide in 1979, he left orders that all his notes on the case be destroyed, rather than turned over to the families or police. This has led some to believe he was in fact murdered for his efforts. In the years that have passed since the disappearance of the girls, identical theories to those offered for the loss of Luria Bible and Ashley Freeman have been put forward. Some people associated with the case believe that Rachel's sister Deborah was withholding key evidence relating to the matter. She had previously been engaged to Tommy, and was living with the couple at the time, but maintained there was no tension between them. Various criminals and suspects were interviewed by the police, with local bodies of water trawled and sunken vehicles recovered. But once again, despite individuals being identified as suspects and questioned, no tangible evidence pertaining to the case has ever come to light. On the morning of the 18th of December 1996, a groundskeeper doing his rounds at the Pleasant Valley Memorial Cemetery in Virginia happened across a grisly scene. Sprawled out across a length of clear plastic sheeting, in an area of the graveyard usually reserved for infants and babies, was the body of a deceased adult female. But as upsetting as the sight of the dead woman was, the circumstances in which she was found would prove equally as disturbing to the employee. In addition to a green knapsack, a portable cassette player and headphones lay on the ground near the deceased. An 8-inch Christmas tree had also been set up beside her, and she had a plastic bag secured around her head, suggesting she had been suffocated. Upon the arrival of investigators, it was ascertained that there was no obvious means of identifying the dead woman. It did not appear she had travelled to the location in a vehicle, and she had relatively few personal effects in her possession. Valium and Brandy were located inside the knapsack, in addition to a $50 bill and a note addressed to the owners of the cemetery. The subsequent post-mortem carried out in relation to the case failed to establish a definitive cause of death. The pathologist concluded that the woman was somewhere between 50 and 70 years old. She was 5 foot tall and possessed curly red hair. It was not known how she had ended up in this particular graveyard or within the area reserved for juvenile burials. Some observers would later suggest that a scar on her stomach, consistent with the caesarean section, could potentially offer some explanation for her death. Eventually, despite a nationwide appeal, the investigation into the mystery woman was shelved due to a lack of evidence. For many years, the story of the Pleasant Valley Jane Doe would remain as infamous as similar cases, such as the Isdal Woman and Australia's Somerton Man. It was not until 20 years later, with the advent of improved DNA analysis, that it was concluded her name was Joyce Summers, heralding from Davenport in Iowa. But the eventual discovery of the woman's identity would end up bringing only further questions about the manner of her death. The Summers family had never reported Joyce missing, believing she had moved out of the local area of her own volition. Furthermore, nobody in the family was aware that she had ever been pregnant, let alone undergone a caesarean section. Investigators have since concluded that Joyce Summers travelled of her own free will to the location to end her life, but the reason for her thousand-mile journey and the selection of the place of her death remains a mystery to this day. There had been no such ambiguity over the cause of death of Rhonda Hinson, but there was an equal degree of uncertainty as to the motive for her killing. 
on the evening of the 22nd of December 1982, the 19-year-old had set off from her work's Christmas party to return home to her parents' address in Valdez, North Carolina. But in the early hours of the following morning, the young factory worker was found lying dead on the ground at the side of Mineral Springs Mountain Road, beside her white Datsun. The wound from the rifle bullet which passed directly through Hinson's heart was plain for all to see, although the position from which it was fired would never become clear. An examination of the victim's car suggested that the shot had been fired from behind the vehicle as it travelled along the highway, penetrating the trunk area and continuing through the rear of the driver's seat. But it remains a source of debate as to whether the fatal shot was fired from a vehicle that was closely following behind hers, or from a shooter at the roadside who had waited for her to pass. Regardless, it was clear that the killer had then approached the Datsun once it had come to a stop, removing the dead girl and then gently laying her down on the ground beside it. Hinson's family were insistent when speaking to the investigating officers as to where the finger of blame should lie. They described in detail how her boyfriend, Charles McDowell, had been jealous and controlling towards her in the days leading up to the party. More worrying still, McDowell's father was a local pastor, and there had been suggestions that he had acted inappropriately towards their daughter. This line of inquiry, however, would quickly come to a dead end, with both father and son presenting alibis for the night of the incident, and passing several police polygraph tests. The public appeal over the crime led to two witnesses coming forward, both of whom claimed to have seen a blue Chevrolet or Trans Am near to the scene, driven by two men. Inquiries with Hinson's friends and co-workers confirmed she had been acting erratically in the months leading up to her death, and may have been having an affair with a married man. Some believed that the two males seen near the scene could have been hired by her mystery lover, either to scare her into not revealing his identity, or to kill her upon his orders. Others would go even further with this story claiming Hinson's lover was a married police officer, whose colleagues had sabotaged the investigation in order to cover up the crime. There are also suggestions that Rhonda may have had some form of premonition in the months leading up to her death. Hinson was the fourth member of her school class to pass away under tragic circumstances over a two-year period, the others dying in car accidents or due to undiscovered health issues. These deaths had seemed to deeply affect the teenager, telling her mother that she believed she would be next, and selecting the music she would want at her funeral. Forty years on, the exact circumstances that led to Rhonda Hinson's death remain a complete mystery. It is possible she was simply the unfortunate victim of a hunting accident, or a prank that had gone horribly wrong. But it remains equally plausible that some hidden aspect of her life had caused someone to want to do her harm. Sadly, as with all the tragedies we have touched upon during this episode, definitive evidence has not been forthcoming. It seems increasingly likely that these mysteries will remain unsolved, offering no closure for the loved ones of the deceased, and forever tainting the festive season in which they were lost. <laughs> 